Okay, thank you very much, Daniel, for this very, very, uh, very nice introduction. Obviously, it's very hard to take up that threshold, and but I'll try to do that here um, in this lecture. Um, it's always it's always difficult to find an entrance point for a lecture, and um, it's always a bit. Um, Interesting how to posit yourself and how you posit potentially your work, your thinking, and your research. The talk that I'm giving today is on a threshold between academia and practice, because not only am I acting as a lecturer here at the University of Sydney for digital architecture, as most of you will know, very many familiar faces here, um, but I'm also a practicing architect. Now, the question for us is always, what are the extents of architecture? What is the extent of research? What is the extent of design? And what is the extent of speculative work that can prompt other forms of architecture into being? Um, so that would probably be the lens that I would like you to look through tonight with me on a couple of works which are, as Daniel has so nicely framed it, brand new, fresh off the press, in a context that has been developing since um, I graduated from Städelschule in 2000, and uh, which have been going through the work of my PhD, which have been going through several research works, which were at that moment categorized as installations, so not your classical standard academic, uh, sorry, architectural practice, um, and which have gone through in an environment that promotes design as research. So research undertaken in, by, and through design is one of the core and um, central themes of this topic. Now, there's different categories of research that I have been undertaking over the last couple of years. One very big um, research realm that we could talk about, which we're not talking about tonight, um, is the idea of a performativity of architecture, a latency of architecture that is included, for example, in the idea of fashion or speculative fashion has reframed uh, um, specific design methodologies that allow us to look at a body in a very different manner. What I also will not talk about, excluding the figures that may be expected for tonight, um, is a performativity of architecture in the sense of acoustic performance, which is research that I have undertaken with colleagues here, uh, um, Denzel uh, Cabrera and uh, Bill Martins and Louis Miranda, which were also very much springing from the seat of Utopia, um, which was a speculative design project we have been running with for two years in the Master um, of Digital Architecture. So those two are the pockets which I will exclude from the talk tonight, but possibly tangentially um, uh, uh, touch um, while covering a couple of topics or themes. Now, the central core of this talk tonight is a couple of observations, a couple of thoughts that deal with the idea of bodies. The complexity of bodies which are infected, which are impacted, which are informed in the current environment of digital media. And we all know that we are possessing these media to a highly uh, large extent. Everybody owns an iPhone, everybody owns a laptop. Uh, laptop has been replacing the TV, we have been replacing landlines, and so forth. So we are, we are bodies that are mediated by information technology, which has become a very substantial um, impact gradient of our life with which we could possibly not do without, where we have withdrawal, um, uh, um, how do you say that, with, with withdrawal symptoms, um, uh, but which we almost not register anymore. So that's the sort of line of the body. And then on the other hand um, of the field that I would like to look at is the idea of generative design. A computational software in Rhino, in Maya, in Katia, through Grasshopper, through processing, through codes, uh, which allows us to produce almost any form, any overabundance of form, any formal variations, uh, without really any restrictive criteria, without any material, uh, material affordances, because we are operating 
in, the, in research studios, in academic uh, uh, fields, in a realm that allows us to play with the toys in the absence of verification, in the absence of, uh, uh, of uh, programmatic requirements, in the absence of material affordances, structural uh, affordances, force flows, um, uh, economic budgets, even client wishes, and so forth. So gener generative design, and that's the way that it's very much being discussed today, is very much anything goes. We can do whatever we want, and there's very little in terms of project parameter or criteria that takes us from this God-like creativity that we can inherit in this realm. That's both good, but it's also bad. Because from a, um, from a respective angle, uh, we are focusing very much on the idea of the architectural object itself, rather than the performance of it. And by performance, I don't really mean a structural performance. I don't really mean a climatic or sustainable or economic performance, but just the performance of something that we have created in order for us to inhabit it. So that's basically one of the key concerns. So having all of these things in mind, most of my work since 2000 really has been dealing with the idea of latency, with the idea of something that may be unfinished, that maybe can be inhabited, that maybe prompts us to perceive, to experience, to sense, to be stimulated by that which we are creating. So my PhD was basically on the idea of latency in fashion. But the continued work, and this is something that I have reflected upon, which I want to share tonight in this sort of work in process review, uh, is, is uh, the idea of the body and how concentration on the body and how the body moves through space, how the body engages with materiality, how the body engages with uh, these ideas of uh, generative design. So beyond these key concepts of morphological variations or transitive geometries or systemic delay or programmatic recombinations, which are all sort of key frames that the generative design, computational design offers, there is this search for incorporating performance, interaction and experience. And that will be the structure of my talk tonight. The, uh, is something that tells us more about the idea of corporeal complexities, the way we understand body, something that looks at the idea of body formations, something that looks at the code that actually informs generative design as a material agency, as a behavior agency, and as a human agency. And then we'll talk briefly about a couple of, um, couple of the things that I have found um, that, that we have uh, produced as speculative installations um, uh, in the area of design research. Concepts of the body are difficult to understand. The body is something that Merleau-Ponty has discussed as phenomena, which is basically the body that perceives a sort of referential plane onto which it operates, which it projects, uh, and which it put forwards into space. So the body is basically a structure of perceptual and behavioral competence. But the body, of course, is always so much more than that. There is nothing that is really this sort of neutral plane where we can take a gradient line and say, everybody baby is the same. The image of the mother is the same. The image of the obsessed lovers is the same. The image of the dead corpse is the same. Because all our bodies are different. All our body identities are different. And all our bodies have a possibility of incorporating different identities at the same time. In the same image, we can find Marilyn Monroe, which is a sort of very, uh, very um, traumatized uh, female body, which has been constricted and confined by Hollywood uh, uh, prompts and, uh, and orders, very much in the same manner as the woman's body here is engirdled in, uh, in the way um, uh, in the way this aspect of beauty has been changed. So our bodies, when we talk about body, we always, of course, mean the physical body, and that image of the physical body changes. But in German, this is something that Drew Leder in his uh, promotional thesis, The Absent Body, points out. The body is something that in uh, English terminology is not really quite as precise as, for example, you know, my German context. Uh, 
uh, as, the, as the word in, in German, for example, says. In German, you have a distinction between Körper and Leib, where the body refers to the physical entity of the body as a sort of a machine, a living, breathing mechanism. Uh, but Leib refers to um, a unity between the spirit and the body itself. So it's something that you can't really dissect from each other. So when we talk about the body, there's much more than just sort of the, the machinic aspect that we may um, be talking about. So Merleau-Ponty notes that the body is not an object, but it's the very medium whereby our world comes into being. But when we talk about Cartesian architecture, that Cartesian architecture basically traps us inside a measurement system. And it doesn't really allow us to gain a deep understanding of corporal reality as an understanding principle, not only as an understanding principle, but as something that can also become a generative principle. We are treating the body in very different manners. We are pl placing the body inside machines through which it can operate. That makes sense for Mick Jagger, obviously, because he is a musician and that's his profession. It doesn't make sense for the mouse who has been operated upon, who becomes this object of experimental research, whereby a foreign body is implanted on the body of the mouse, but that foreign body does not contain its function. It contains uh, the mere shape of the, of the organ itself. Yeah? So, of course, science undertakes these in experiments in order to look at skin tissues, but an image like that can be very well used to understand how complex corporal realities, how complex bodies can be generated in an environment where science undertakes um, basically studies like this. So the body is something that has possibly a hybrid identity in our age. It, has, it is something that is uh, uh, highly uh, prostheticized. It is something that in, uh, introduces a critical discourse. So uh, Bertowska says we are bodies that are heavily invaded uh, and technologized. But it may also be that we understand them as prosthetic devices, the unity, the corporeal complexity that is formed by human and machine mergings, by a rethinking of these protocols, which allows us to substitute um, parts of our body and our bodily functions, which allows us to, uh, uh, to possibly uh, regain functions that have been lost in war zones or through birth defects. But it also enables us to bridge towards digitally fabricated environments, towards, towards these technologized environments which we are increasingly operating with today. So at that moment, we are leaving Merleau-Ponty's um, sort of preferential plane towards something that is highly digital, that is highly virtual, and that is highly uh, unforeseeable in the way that it operates, because the main part of that machinery is no longer the technical gadget. It's the information that runs through that technical gadget. It's the program code, it's the mode of operation that informs the machine, and by that also informs the human that actually is situated within that machine. Now, connecting back to the idea of the body as something that can be rethought, where, of course, Marcel Breuer in the 1930s is completely satisfied with a, uh, with a moment of anxiety where he dissects his uh, physical body. We are um, now operating, and this is one of the core images in architecture. This has been heavily deployed by um, people like Ben van Berkel or UN Studio, uh, sorry, that's the same man, um, by Greg Lynn. Um, the manimal, which is actually a hybrid entity of character properties which are shared between different species, which would not normally breed with each other. So what you see here in this uh, very iconographic image is the, is the uh, chemical um, interpolation, if you want, between a human, a lion, and a snake. And the reason why this is so um, thought-provoking, why this is so scary is that at that moment when you have these different animal entities linked with each other, you are also superimposing 
the animal character traits. So you cannot really be sure if that man, animal, don't know how we would categorize something like that, would behave because he might have the bravery of a lion, but he may also have the slyness of a snake. Then, of course, there's the question, how is that relationship towards architecture being generated? What do we do when we look at architecture? How do we, how do we perceive architecture? And architecture as that which prompts into being our understanding of our bodies. Do we do that um, like the way Marcel Duchamp has been using that? And that's still a very good image because it's basically a door that is always open or it's always closed because it dissects different programmatic planes. Um, or it would be something as the living door, where you have to take a choice which person, which naked body you're actually going to face when you are going through that sort of threshold condition. And that's exactly the point that this talk is specifically interested in, this idea of ambiguity, this idea of unexactness, this idea of choice that we are taking, this idea of engaging with something that prompts us to become other, to prompt us towards a different understanding of the architecture, towards something that allows, through its unexactitude, to uh, engage with a feeling of intensity, of recognition, of reformulation of your own identity. Part of what has informed this research that I'm going to talk about in a minute is uh, a 4E um, approach, which, 4EA, sorry, which basically means embodied, embedded, enacted, extended, and affected. This is a terminology that comes out of neurological observations, which basically looks at networks in the brain structure, uh, the way we are uh, engaging with our environment, and the way we are looking at behavioral components. So, in our, in our process of becoming, in our process of aging, we are learning specific habits, which are very hard to overcome. These habits are partially, and that's this whole conversation about nature versus nurture, these behaviors are something that are partially trained, which partially come from our genes, so there's a sort of very ambiguous framework between what our environment prompts us to behave like, and something where we are genetically oriented towards too in order to go somewhere. So at the moment we see a spider, everybody knows that situation. We are in a sort of state of fright or flight, yeah? simply because evolution has trained us over millions of years that the spider, which may not be difficult at modern times, has, is, is in fact an element of danger in anima. What the 4EA approach basically provides us with is that there is a cognitive reprogramming possible in order to gauge with our environment. So the idea of our corporeality as something that is learned, something that is trained, can be untrained. Which basically, to, shut, uh, to cut a long uh, sentence short, means your brain is a muscle. If you use that muscle, if you flex it, you can untrain yourself. You, we have a continuous curve of learning that is cut short with our death. It is not cut short by our adolescence. It doesn't, you don't stop learning when you hit 20. You don't stop learning when you hit 60. Uh, you stop learning when you die, basically. So there's hope for all of us because there's a program that we can learn. There's different stimulations that we can use. There is a sensory engagement that can be made use of. Now, I'd like to juxtapose that with the idea of generative design and an environment of code, which is obviously something where the body as a concept and the idea of corporeality and um, uh, um, corporeality or behavior of human traits is strangely absent. So we have entered an environment where we have completely replaced the touching of the hands, the touching of the earth, the sea, the smell, and so forth with something that translates as architects, of course, our environment into digits, where we have a programmatic code which operates according to natural scientific observations, which enables us to produce now environments. And here, this is, of course, a critique of generative or computational design that looks exclusively at the shape of forms, 
where this procedural protocols of generative design do not embed the touch, the, the environment, the light conditions, the hapticity of something that we are so dependent upon because the stimulus is actually that which keeps us alive. There have been um, studies undertaken with Harvard students or as Leanne pointed out so likely, with kittens that if they are completely devoid of stimulation, the mind tends to deteriorate. So even when we embrace an aspect of generative design, we can by no means exclude our obsessions with processes and codes of generative form making because that would be cutting a huge amount of data or a huge amount of criteria out of the equation. But what generative design offers is a language of principles. It's a language of design methodologies. And this is just a very small overview of all of the processes and codes which have become available through us, through scientific research. And we can basically look at, um, uh, at the uh, earliest observations, like the Voronoi diagram, which is something that uh, uh, René Descartes has uh, described in the, Michael would probably know that better, 15th century, yeah? Towards something uh, like the Lorentz attractor or swarm behaviors, which are very much part um, of a, a, a current digital discourse. Now, what, the, what these observations actually provide is a language of mathematics, which has been extensively researched in scientific background and which have become the base operation for any form generation language that we're actually developing at the moment through our computers. So if we talk about Lindemeyer systems, that's a natural scientific observation, and it allows us now to go into a serious fractal growth where you can go to the internet, where you can go through the forums uh, um, and look for processing codes which are impromptu available to everyone at all times, Yet we do not really know what we do with that because at, the, at that moment, if we look, just look at the mathematical language exclusively without the project parameters, without any integration of corporeality, it does not really lead us to a fully fledged architectural proposal. So laws of nature deliver codes and principles and programs which enable us to do design principles, which in turn can be applied to architectural pro projects, because these design principles are scaleless, they are materialless, they are devoid construction, so they are a fantastic realm of operation and play. Um, and at some moment, it would be really good to come back into an iterative design process. And this is linking back to the idea of design as research, something that we see that we critically reflect, where we go through different uh, stages of synthesis, of ideation, of envisioning, selection, visualization, and of course uncertainty at all times. You need to check your um, parameters and critically observe if that project is actually then doing what you want it to do. What this project or what this talk here wants to do is really to look at the possibility of linking a mathematical language back to the idea of a complex body, of a complex moving body. And the research that I want to, that I want to introduce here today is a research that is strongly bound with the idea of choreography as an expressive tool, as the moment of touch, as the idea of a code that runs from materiality towards machinery, which might enable you to go through digital fabrication towards the impacting on the behavior of a human being within that space, which looks at the delicate moments of contrapoint, which looks at the delicate moments of gravity and balance, and which looks at the very subtle nuances of a touch on a body and the feeling that it prompts for that body itself. So this is basically something that has been leading up towards the research, which has been part of a speculative installation in a nutshell, Trivet Fields, uh, something that we have produced with uh, Alexander Jung and Joanne Djakovic and Phil Granger in 2006 for the Tinschatz Gallery. Um, Trivet Fields, which is an interactive sensate 
installation of hundreds of laser cut digitally fabricated modules, which are uh, conceptualized in such a manner that they are based on a very, very simple cutting scheme, which allows these, this prop to be executed in different materialities, so in translucent, transparent, and black, which was equipped with different holes, um, and uh, which was also then animated in the sense that the, uh, the, the way it was composed was not completely erratic. But the thinking behind this diverse component group is how can we, with the simplest means, produce a module that interacts as a swarm, that dives and lives through the idea of a machinery where the swarm has a specific intelligence uh, through its individual members and organization, but where the swarm also uh, situates an environment in which each of these individual members contributes uh, to one another. Because the behavior here in a swarm is controlled by signal frequency of communication through binary logic. And the way that is then implemented in the installation is by means of electronic sensing by electronic uh, light emissions, as in the LED apparatus. And what you can't see here is the computer that fed, fed back the tracing of movement uh, of diverse interactants into this very controlled environment with a very, very crude but very uh, seat-like display of a memory trace whereby different visitors interacted through sound emission, through light, by tracing the object itself, and where these memory traces were superimposed on each other and allowed, uh, and allowed feedback of uh, occupants which had been inhabiting that system before. Um, though it had not been formulated at that point, of course, the main point here is that the, not the swarm itself is really the component group. The body that has been created here is a body, of course, of the exhibition of these Perspex module members. But more importantly, it's an invitation, it's an engagement of the temporary body or the, the temporary presence um, of, the, uh, um, uh, of the visitor to to be part of that system, to come in contact with it and to play with it and to feed from it. So that's a very early work that um, we have been undertaking in 2006. And then for a long time, I've been occupied with architecture. So that's sort of my moment of breathe and inhale. So. Starting off with digital architecture here at Sydney University, basically engaging again with the idea of performativity, but performativity in an environment of theatricality, which basically means that there is a staged corporal reality to the things that we do. In a staged design, the body appears as something that has a representational value, not, a, a not, not exclusively a sensational value. Um, so one part of this was um, a critical engagement with theatres and plays, performances uh, of uh, brand iconic architectures uh, which can, uh, can prompt uh, temporary pavilions, for example, into being. That's our engagement with a uh, very long engagement uh, with Sydney Festival, which didn't really come uh, to such a very happy marriage at the end of the day. Um, but one sideline that we also have run um, is is the idea of nature as a form giver. The, the idea of nature is something that produces form uh, in, uh, in, as, a, as a sort of evolutionary solution that runs through behavioral codes, that runs through material properties. Because, and this is, may connect to some of you guys, uh, where we basically had a couple of conversations about how architecture um, can be simulating nature, can be replaying nature, can be working through natural principles. Um, that basically means in nature, material is cheap, and I've stated that before. Uh, sorry, shape is cheap. Um, but material is expensive because every growing, every living, every breathing organism must produce, uh, uh, must produce its growth by the intake of energy. 
So nature can be looked at as a sort of uh, archive for wild productions of beautiful organic forms uh, that you're looking at, of which we have been using one of these here, um, the honeycomb structure, which is a base condition of life, the hexagon, because it has the ability to go through triangulation, it has the ability to form hexagons, it has the ability to be prompted into sphere packing, so densification, three-dimensionality. Um, it is a pattern that in itself has a capacity of uh, evolution, of growing formations, of producing different morphologies, such as the bee is producing a honeycomb structure, and the same system is then underlying the multiple faceted compound eyes of the fly. And the same system underlies also, which is uh, then sort of exploded into a Voronoi pattern with the gecko feet, uh, which has the ability to climb up these walls. Yes, yeah, so, so it's a, you can basically say that the, um, that the honeycomb is a structure that allows um, to cells to be produced and varied. It uh, produces plates and tectonic patterns and it produces uh, hollows with the, like the honeycombs or, um, or the cells in itself. I think I'll abandon my um, script here now at this moment uh, and just keep going into, into the research. So, this, taking, taking this as a base principle, looking at the mathematical language that nature offers and keeping that in mind as something that was tangential to the research, we now come back to the idea of uh, of a complex corporal reality. And this section of the talk actually discusses the idea of how complex bodies can be situated in relationship towards each other, how we can identify a body, how can we reprogram a body identity, how can we shape material complexities that engage curiosity that engages stimulation, that enable us to live and breathe and understand ourselves, possibly as something more than architecture tends to look at um, in an environment where generative design has a complete absence of the, uh, um, of the human body or in where the architectural object becomes the sort of body itself uh, towards something where we can foster uh, this engagement. So the next couple of three projects that I would like to talk to where I want to draw out a couple of lines and connections for that are all undertaken with my colleague Lian Lok, who is sitting here tonight uh, and with whom we have um, sub submitted parts of this uh, research for an ARC grant. Now, Black Spring has been living and breathing, has been developing an environment of biome. Biome is basically a toy that we have come up with um, uh, which has been running as an um, exhibition in August 2012, with, which was paralleled with a uh, symposium um, on the, at the same time, uh, where the affordance, or where we, we were looking for contributions by possibly artists, mathematicians, biologists, uh, musicians, architects, uh, um, and so forth, in regards to the theme of what happens if we go beyond our initial obsession with digital technology? What happens when we take on our concerns about the human nature, about our sta states of desire, about our states of dreaming, um, and so forth? So this one here is developed uh, in, in relation with Lian Loki, uh, with, uh, with James Lee, uh, Jonathan Fernandez, Marjo Niemela, Elmer Treffs, um, and Alex Jung as part of the Biome Show. It is a topography that consists of different elements, different complex bodies that are living in a digital, virtual environment and which have become actualized through different series of materiality. It exists as a topography that has a possibility of mapping different interactions onto each other. It formulates an environment which is possibly post-digital in the sense that it revokes echoes uh, of an industrial nation. It has echoes and prompts analogies with the idea of the uh, jet fighter, which is sort of the 
the best sculptural piece the American Navy has come up with, the intelligence of military operations. And it also connects the intelligence of swarm systems, uh, which are very much still uh, part of third world countries. So in that way, it draws from a cultural conscience of different bodies and body identities that we are, that we are working through. Now this topography, and this is a very quick run through the making of it, this topography is a sort of base condition uh, that operates according to a single cutting scheme, which has been multiplied um, and, and executed in a number of different materials, uh, which has become, in its digital version, something that has, through its code, informed the manufacturing process in MDF and in Perspex and different variations. Uh, where the topography identifies contact points with the petals, where the topography is situated and displaced in space uh, as a spatial complex installation. So it runs up the wall, it comes and hangs down, uh, hangs down the walls. Uh, but it's also something that leaves a trace. And these are the moments that we are specifically interested in. The moment where the shadow is created. The moment where the interaction takes place. The moment where you have shifting light conditions which run through different modes. So this topography, as you see it, is assembled through very many different parts. But it is juxtaposed and it is parallel because it has, it's very ambiguous, it's very inexact in terms of its materiality uh, in, in such a manner that it effectively calls for detail. So the detail then is provided by a flowery pattern, a petal, a swarm-like figure again, if you want, that is, um, that is oriented towards principles of nature. So we've been looking at bilateral symmetries which are part of um, natural principles, may they be plants or may they be uh, parts of the animals. And, and they also share elements of a radial symmetry in the way that the flower is organized, like this orchid-like behavior. And this is, one of the, uh, this is one of the petals itself. Now, this body is made through an idea of a sheet, uh, um, sorry, um, of a sheet logic. So it's something that comes from the idea of the triangulation, as has been set out as a basic pattern here. And from that basic pattern, different typologies can be cut. Um, so while this has been, this is basically the source code of the patterns that appears. Uh, and then digitally fabricated are different versions uh, that run through that source code and prompt them into being. It's a complex entity in itself because it consists of two different planes which are uh, tied together with cable binders and which have partially leaves and stems. So it is something that is very well between the idea of an insect and the idea of uh, an orchid itself. Now the second part uh, of the, or the third part of the installation consists of a motor actuation. So on the one hand we have the topography in itself, which sets a specific, makes space, sets the place, sets the plane for the interaction. On the other hand, we have the flowers, which are the minor, minute detail which allows people to engage with the installation itself. And then on the other hand, we have the program behavior, the programmatic code, uh, which is put into being by a couple of motors which set, are set up within that installation and which operate in a very generic, very principled manner as a, uh, as a sort of abstract topography that is operated according to nine, uh, nine points that control a sort of visual plane. Now in Black Spring, we have um, different actuations that actually do take place. We have um, a programmed uh, program behavior, behavior which can be almost spooled automatically and which makes these flowers move. Um, but we also have the possibility of interaction, um, which we have been using through Kinect sensing. So here's a sort of shot of the um, motors themselves. And then the last and final bit was to look at how, if this is a sort of matrix-like environment, if this is something where the post-industrial machines have come, spring back to life and which are sympathetic to a human being where we're creating this great environment, is there a possibility to uh, to subject the body inside that configuration with something. So part of the prototyping here is the idea of the wing, the Prometheus, so the Daedalus, who goes up towards the sun and is possibly 
uh, able to fly again, which is of course then modeled according to wings of uh, birds here, which we have been uh, operating with. We definitely had fun with that. So part of, part of that was sort of exploring the choreography available through an instrument that is part of the topography that you can inhabit, but that's also a sort of prosthetic device in itself. So the, here's a couple of uh, moments within uh, choreography that we have undertaken throughout this laboratory of four weeks um, inside, the, um, inside the Tin Sheds Gallery. Now, Lian, whose part um, is very much the, uh, the interaction design, the programming of that code, um, um, has, um, has uh, adopted Suchmann's analytical framework, uh, which allow us to look at the choreography, not something as something that is a sort of creative endeavor, but as something that actually tells us a very, um, almost like a scientific analysis of what that choreography is. So Suchmann says there are actions which inter, sorry, there, there, there's a shared point between the user and the machine. There are actions that are not available to the machine. There are actions available to the machine. There are effects available to the user. And then there is the machine doing whatever it does. Yeah? So, so there's a possibility of tracing back in a shaping of that interface of prompts that work through and that connect the idea of the the, the idea of the program performer, the idea of the program behavior of the motors, uh, which then are seen as the movement of the flowers and these petals going, uh, uh, going up and down. And this is a bit more of sort of the architecture that, uh, that this play prompts stimulation and engagement uh, into being. A couple of the best moments were when people just directly interacted um, with that system itself. Now, for Black Shroud, um, which, we have, um, which, uh, which we have been producing for the pop-up gallery in the rocks as part of the organized cacophony, uh, we've been looking at a more simplified system. So again, we've been looking at the idea of the flowers. Um, again, we have been looking at the idea of how that is prompted into being. But at this moment here, we are going through an idea of Marion, and well, I shouldn't really say Marion. It's something like an operator. It's a triangle that interfaces between nature's honeycomb structure, which is the underlying pattern that appears here in this uh, geometry. So the operator, as you will see in the later images, enables us to engineer groups, component groups of members which are interacting in that system. So while the flowers were operated in Black Spring, were operated through a simple mesh, where the mesh was sort of the interpolator between the servo motor action and the, and the flowers themselves. Here we have a system that is much more organized and much more controlled. Groups of three and potential interconnections between these group of three, uh, which are substituting the mesh as sort of the, uh, the blanket. We have also reworked, and this is where the design is research, because you take specific context parameters and you change, um, you change parameter values, which in this case relates back to the idea of the form. Um, so from a multitude of six or seven different types of flowers, which could be assembled based on this component part, which was varied in different sizes and which was equipped with the stems or possibly also with the LED lights, we went back to a very simplified system of a flower that is produced through one one-dimensional plate, which basically means that we, while these were formulated by two parts of that, in principle, two planes of this, we are producing the same uh, flower here uh, with a single plane, which is basically a sort of digitally fabricated optimization process, if you want, um, uh, to, to look at sort of material excess that you avoid in, in producing. So what you see here then is that the, that the topography in which the performer operates is actually something that goes back to a re preferential plane, if you want, a reference plane, uh, which is built up by uh, literally a framework in which these groups uh, of petals, these groups of flowers are situated and which are then uh, connected, it's a pity that we can't see it here, which are then connected to a, a sort of grid um, of possible placement of these motors. 
No, I never understood before, but the labeling system with a motor action like that is pretty crucial. So the program behavior on paper or in code is one thing, and then the execution in material is obviously something uh, completely different, as you, uh, as you may see in the correction. So this is here at the rocks, going into the rocks and putting up the, uh, the structure um, uh, putting up the structure in a corner in a niche of the existing architecture. You also see here, these are the operators which uh, basically manipulate always three flowers. Um, and you see this is basically the flesh of the architecture, the void in which the, uh, the motors give their prompts towards the flowers which are then hanging underneath. Um, and you see here this change or this shift of an operator system, of a reference plane from a very diverse, differentiated uh, topography towards a Cartesian system that was simplified, but that also allowed a more different or different uh, motor action. Um, I won't go too much into detail here, but we are currently look, going back and looking at the different manuals that we've been revising in terms of code and in terms of processing. There's a very huge difference conceptually between something that you, where you model a topography in a uh, in, a, in a digital software environment like Rhino, which you can possibly connect to uh, through Grasshopper, and where you can superimpose a coded behavior towards processing as a language itself, which enables a much more faceted, much more multiplied um, environment in which behavior can be um, organized in a swarm system like that. So that's. Um, that's a sort of very equal, very homogeneous field if you have a sort of top view, which then changes through the interaction, through the engagement, which again changes through the light conditions, um, uh, the sounds and the noises and the people who are uh, potentially interacting um, with that sort of scheme. Now the last bit of that series, and that's the, that's the last project that I wanted to present today, which comes straight from the printing press, so to speak, or from my uh, image archive, um, is the idea of gold. Gold um, is an installation that we have been producing in February 2013 as part uh, of a uh, call for expressions uh, of interest in producing a stage set design uh, for a play, um, which uh, has been produced by the Living Room um, Theatre and which has been scripted by uh, Michel Sankt An. Um, that play, which is now um, sadly finished, went for uh, 10 days within the space of the, um, of the Pier 2 and 3 at the Wharf Theatre. Um, um, and uh, it has, it's sort of a quite sad story, which is not easy to... Uh, not easy to transport. It's a story about Laura who has been um, heavily abused by her father and his local mates at the RSL club uh, to whom she has been rented out since she has been 12 years old. So that alone is already a story in itself and that alone raises the imagination and calls for different bodies that are interacting in a very literal sense uh, with each other. Um, as a group of architects, we have been assigned with, because we had been pitched, uh, we, we had pitched uh, different, um, different expressions, we have been assigned from the start um, with a specific, um, with one specific stage set. The whole theater operates within the pier as a staged environment where people run through, walk through, the performance, a performance that unfolds for one and a half hours on these two levels within that old, very old, very industrial hall, which is a great architectural context, but which also, of course, has these defaults of not being completely a sheltered environment, not completely being uh, um, a, a theatrical environment. But what from the very first moment became very critical to us was that that idea of the theater is radically different to anything that you would see today. Which would basically say, um, I'm not going to do it now, I would do it, <laughs> I would do it at a different stage. But normally you have, everyone is basically looking at me, which is a very different situation, and I just love this moment when you can walk into the room, which changes the idea of perspective towards a multiple viewpoint 
And if I now was talking to Lian and Lian was responding to me, you would suddenly have one set of situation um, um, happening here. And then if potentially uh, some other people at the back would start to speak, then someone who is a performer in that space, somebody who is an actor in that space, would have a potential multi-perspective, a po potential multi-sensate space, which is very, um, in, in its manner, very different to organize towards the static theatrical approach that we are normally living in. So a very complex narrative, a very complex space, a very complex approach to architecture, all criteria which were not easy to answer for. And on top of everything, we had um, undertaking this as a field of research study with Master of Architecture students. So instead of coming up with a single approach towards that singular space within these 10 spaces of the theater performance, um, we had 18 students, which basically meant we had nine projects, which were all very diverse, which had great ideas, um, but which did not really give us a design. So we set up a sort of uh, material trapdoor, which related back to the story. So in the trapdoor in this, um, um, in potentially in this field here is the idea of gold because Laura had been solved, which is, of course, a very literal environment. But gold is something that has very many different connotations, that has very many different layers embedded in itself. So gold can range from the gold rush and the identity of, uh, of America as a sort of Western, Western culture with the digging of nuggets which have informed complete ecologies um, towards gold as in jewelry, which enhances every man's desire, towards gold as the scarab or the beauty mask, or uh, in a religious context framing um, reliquien. Yeah. Um, um, it so it has this connotation of excess. It has this connotation of overabundance. It has the connotation of fertility, Zeus coming to Danae in the shape of a golden rain. Um, it has the connotation of death, like in Goldfinger. Yeah? It has the imagination and the propelling through liquid gold, which is a sort of drug, obviously. It has the religious context of the golden calf, and so forth, and so forth. So gold is something that interpolates, that, that pulls apart different notions, weaves uh, different interests of desires and dreams, of something that prompts the imagination and that prompts the sensation. So the, here are basically the conceptual layers that we have been using for that installation here. So gold as sort of the material framework in which we're operating. A concept of Marcel Duchamp as a conceptual translator towards that very difficult story where it's not very easy to find a common ground for that. And a system uh, which I'll discuss um, sort of in a minute. Now, as a sort of joint factor, as the last way out, as the way to propel, to find a unified vision for a couple of individuals where we had different project partners, uh, because we also, uh, we were also working with uh, Emma Treffs uh, from Semnon, we were working with Eduardo Barata from, from UFO, um, Alexander Jung with Lian, um, to, to have this very diverse team of uh, practitioners um, engaging in that and to have the uh, have, the, have the students working with this. What we did was to use Marcel Duchamp. Marcel Duchamp for, for its point of inspiration because Marcel Duchamp with that large glass has been leaving behind the idea of painting. So the bright strip bare by her bachelors is sort of, um, has, be, has been deployed here as a sort of base diagram. What you see on top um, is this very amorphous figure of the bride. Uh, what you see below is a couple of nine malic molds, which are uniforms that can be associated with professional professions, uh, of course, in the context of 1915. The police, uh, policeman, the butler, the chauffeur, the train rider, and so forth. Um, we have here the chocolate grinder, and we have a couple of prosthetics, which I don't really have the time at the moment to explain, but there's a connection within that system that plays upon the imagination of the observer, where the bride is in a dreamlike state, where we're not quite clear, is the bride imagining the bachelors, 
who are dreaming about her? Or is there a direct connection between the bride and that cosmic splash, that eruption of energy that is depicted in the lower part of the building? So what it actually does is it's a diagram about the process that brings desire into being, that combines different figures and different facts, different bodies um, in a unified um, environment. So that's sort of the conceptual background. Now the, now the strategic, the systemic approach uh, is working with something that has come through Buckminster Fuller, and that's that idea of a Hobermann sphere, which basically means a system that collapses back onto itself. It works with gravity and can be pulled by very uh, particular points, which we then have translated uh, for... Um, um, for, for the installation in a very complex, not so very complex, in a mechanism that has the capacity to interact by push and pull, uh, which, and which also has, as the flowers had in the black project, a kind of animalistic entity, a kind of uh, identity that bridges between uh, something that is a plant and something that's an animal, something that has a locomotive behavior, something that corresponds to external forces, um, um, which became a main driver for the project. So that's sort of the development of the prototypes here, which have been going through different stages because the distances and measurements at the beginning of the system were not quite exact. So here is the design research, an element of optimization within one complex prototype that has been modeled three times in executed in different materials uh, in order to be able to respond uh, or to behave in that specific manner. Now in space, it has this capacity of glow. It has this capacity almost like a jellyfish of emitting this sort of bioluminescence in the sense that it corresponds with light. So it's not only an um, from at least from our perspective, uh, a geo, uh, geometrically engaging figure, but it also has, and that's what you find in the Perspex mirror material, a possibility of corresponding to the light emissions, acting in itself as a sort of light source in that overall uh, very dark, very theatrical environment. And that was one of the most stimulating points that I experienced while putting up that exhibition. You can do very much of these prototypings in a very close environment, such as the digital workshop or in the studio and so forth. It's a very, very different manner when you have the correct light conditions. So we went and rocked up into that space and nothing was enough. Nothing was enough to fill it. it everything, these animal entities were completely lost in th inside that vast landscape of the industrial hall. Um, but at the moment where the light conditions were right, they actually started to glow. They had their own life and they were actually taking space. So here the scissor mechanism that we see is again based organizationally on the hexagon figure, which is the base condition of life. The scissor mechanism in itself uh, has been uh, sort of called uh, the spider. Um, but it has the capacity to be grouped uh, in a figure of six, at which moment then it makes a crown-like figure. As part of that, as part of a complementary part of the scissor mechanism, we also have been, which acts as the procedures in a way, um, according to Marcel, Marcel Duchamp's concept diagram, uh, we also, of course, have the bride, and we've all been working on the bride. So the bride has been that inflatable that's been... Uh, carefully cut and uh, attended to with the um, emergency uh, blankets, which we had lovingly designed in a specific form, which completely behaved in a different manner at the moment where it was inflated, because then this inflated body tends to just behave uh, as it's on. And again, it's really the execution in the material. It's really about how complex can you generate a materiality at the moment um, when it comes into being, there's a complexity that goes with the material identity itself. And the act of executing with the hand uh, the different versions of its coming into being. So that's a sort of pre-study towards the crown here, tested in a sort of more um, translucent stage. And here's, the, um, here's sort of the uh, pendant towards the Hobermann sphere. The, um, the crown system being held in space, in time, in place by 
two points where the third point can actually act as the operator, as the accentuator, as the, as the pulley that makes the movement in space possible. So again, this exercise of digitally laser cutting, nesting, vinyl nesting, optimizing, um, optimizing the figures and then constructing these nodes. So we have different component parts here, six different component parts which make the, the arms and the legs, which were also transformed in order to give a more spidery character at the end of the day. And this knot, uh, which is also um, made from three different plates plus inserted points which then hold the, um, hold the legs. And the last but not the least very important part was of course this cosmic eruption that makes the translation from Marcel Duchamp. So this is something that is as much a cultural figure, a cultural sign as the little animals that you had seen in the Black Spring were, where uh, where sort of the code, uh, code is remembered uh, by sympathetic technology. So the fleur de lis is the hanging rain of 64 individual um, base figures, which are repeated um, and, um, uh, and transformed endlessly in order to exemplify uh, encounters with the men that occupy Laura's body. So now the fleur de lis is obviously also something you may know that. Um, the fleur de lis is a triangle, which is the exemplification of the female figure, but the female virgin figure. Now, if you turn the triangle uh, upside down, everybody knows that from reading Angels and Demons, you have the female chalice, which is basically the sign for, for the female. Yeah, so, so it's an interpolation between that which is sort of sanctified and that which is uh, demonized, uh, both from a sort of female perspective. Now, this is still a draft, but that's us occupying the space. There were three big inflatable bubbles, um, as you see here, the three brides, which behaved radically different towards each other, depending on the context in which they were um, situated. So what we had not calculated in this whole vast landscape of the industrial hall was the climatic influence. Normally, if you do an interior installation, you do not really encounter heavy wind forces. That was something that came back to haunt us again and again and again. So the state of that bright here has been heavily enforced by the wind that was channeling across and underneath the harbor bridge, which tore her so that she moved like a wild bull in space and tore off her anchor points, uh, which led uh, eventually over the period of two weeks uh, to the abandoning of any more beauty treatments for that specific bride. Um, the other ones behaved in a more mannered uh, mode. So here's the, um, again, the reflections with the fleur de lis. Here is the reflection and the movement, the engagement of the, the kinetic behavior, which is almost not programmed, but which acts through the wind forces interacting on site. If we had known that before, that would have been something that we could have scheduled. And here's, here's the dissolution of the object by light condition, which was a sort of very, it, it's, a, it's a byproduct, but it's really the interest that we do have in looking at these complexities. So it's the, it's the body of the bride that touches the ground, which becomes dominated by her own shadow. And on the right hand side, we see an ideation process of relationships that we have been using in order to instruct, or not, we couldn't really instruct, but to offer towards the performers different means of engagement with that uh, with that bride, so uh, with a prosthetic handle by pulling the, pulling the bride along, by, uh, by pushing her, by engaging with her, by bodily touching her. Um, so that's a sort of, there's a couple of more which I, I'm not uh, showing here. So it's a sort of getting in contact with the object itself. And then through that contact, through that means or mode of operation, uh, the identity changes. So this, this is here a very complex body of uh, of someone occupying that space within, which is uh, normally not, uh, not penetrable. And what you see here is different moments of the situation where then the, uh, where then the performers have appropriated. And this also exemplifies a learning curve for us in our self-controlled -control installation, like the Black Spring 
and the Black Shroud, we were the owners of the choreography. With Eilert Todd Sampson, we had to let that ownership of choreography go. So what we produced at the end of the day was we provided a complex topography that could be inhabited, but there was no means of controlling in which way the actors or the audience choose to inhabit that topography. Um, so, of course, they developed a specific routine, and one reason that we understood why the inflatables were torn again and again and again, and they called us and let us mend them, were because they were so heavily interacting with these inflatables, which is, of course, good from a, uh, from a sort of um, interaction point of view, which was, of course, not so good in terms of uh, going back again and mending and bending. This, unfortunately, this is not very visible, but as part of the research or the part of the reflection on the design, which then draws out the necessary design knowledge that can be appropriated for different purposes or different installations, is this table here that, uh, that in a matrix kind of manner spells out different levels. So on one, one end here, we have the level of the narrative. So that's the idea of the of Laura's story. On the second hand, here we have the level of the concept. So that spells out how, um, uh, how Marcel Duchamp comes diagrammatically into place. And then on level three, we have the appropriation of both. So if I just take along this line, uh, we, we have the a condition of the literal body as a sign. Then we have, on Laura's level, we have the bodily exchange with her encounters with different men. On the level of the concept, we have the slopes of flow, or the splashes and the crashes, which are described, um, which are described by Marcel Duchamp. And we have the rain, the fleur de lis, part of which are interactant or interactive, um, and part of which um, uh, remain static. So this is Gabrielle interacting with the different components in that field. That's the body of the piano, which shows strange similarities towards the springing of the fleurs. In fact, the strings had um, a bodily present in themselves. At the moment where the light hits them, they become very prominent. Well, we had actually designed the fleurs to be part of it. This is also something that you only can understand once you put things um, into being. And this is a basic sort of recap that looks at the different, uh, um, at an evolutionary system that is almost like a trace line that runs through different installations. So on top we have this cutting scheme of the trivet field, which was ex executed as a sort of very generic diagram of a circle with impact. On the right-hand corner here, we have the black spring and the diversity of different petals. So they are both cutting schema which allow different methods of actualization, of coming into being and variations. Um, to the left-hand side here, we have the black sh uh, spring shroud, the organization of a field that runs through triangulated operators um, uh, in a hexagonal field here. And then... In four, we have gold, which is irrespective of the laying out of an organizational field where the behavioral pattern actually informs the geometry of the object and the logic of its behavior. And that is my moment of breathing through. We try to produce these complex corporealities so as to generate sparks, so as to generate imagination, synaptic connections, so as, to, so as to let us breathe. Because I think in the best case scenario, architecture is that which not only prompts us into being, which stimulates our sensations, but that which actually makes us come alive. Thank you very much.
also in materiality, cold reality. But, but I also make an argument that the history of humanity is, is messier than simply that bodily relationship to materials. There is a the narrative component of history, which involves our interpretation, which has nothing to do with material. In fact, it denies materiality. It insists that there is no materiality for us to understand the reality. Yeah. And I, I just wonder that the possibility in all this work, in terms of the systems and the services, which is to say the engagement, what do you see the future of us, us meaning the people outside the work, not the people who made the work, but us being able to confect it, not simply with our bodies, but with our interpretation of it. There's a, there's a writing possibility in terms of, if I don't know Duchamp, and I don't know the large glass, how can I reread your project and make it something else? I can do that with my body, right? I can affect the, the bride, I can change the location of things in space. How can I bring my interpretation in? I'm just wondering if the possibility of all these tools, how you allow for not simply physical infection, but uh, interpretive infection. Is that from a performance point of view, or is that from a maker's point of view? From someone who is neither the performer nor the maker, uh, let's not call them the observer, but let's call them the reader. Yeah. Well, that of course is a, is a question of also of how you would allow ownership, because I think you are, uh, or, or authorship, or control over that system. Um, because what you're asking is, 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 not, is not in fact how do people engage with that, because they engaged far better at moments where the, um, where the installation was actually in peace, in delay, in advance of the actual performance taking place. So we had people who were coming back and playing with the in instruments as such. Um, but I think you are, you are asking for a, sy a system like that being exposed on its own with different other people taking ownership, with materials aggregating on it, with materials uh, being propped up and going in conjunction with, this, with these delicate bodies. Is that the question? Yeah. I it's not really a question about any of these projects per se, it's, it's more about the opportunities inherent in applying these kind of systems. Mm. Do you see that there's a possibility that they, they can let us move beyond the haptic in terms of how we affect the space around us and provide a kind of, let's say, a, a narrative reflection of yeah. space? Yeah, I actually do not see them as artifacts in themselves. For, for me, this is not really a sort of creative endeavor. Um, it has elements of creativity and it has elements of, uh, of art. Um, it does not really have to be in a sort of performance environment either. I'm more interested in, in the idea of sort of the genetic code that runs through that and something that would be a sort of parallel um, to it, one, one thought that I had um, in, in conjunction to that is, is basically if, if genes are, if we are expressions of our genes, if the driving motor is the DNA and one piece of double helix can come with that millions of possibilities of creating life, then there's also this um, theory of the, um, of the and I can't really pronounce it in a correct manner, the, the, this idea of the meme, something that is a sort of cultural achievement that is being uh, that that is being prompted into life, like the achievement of the wheel, or the achievement of the hammer, or the achievement of the robot. So, so it's more like a, div a cultural <coughs> development that keeps processing through which we are um, we are basically the transmitters of these uh, of di different formations of these cultural expressions reformulating themselves. So, which is basically not answering the question, but I'm sort of rephrasing it for that I found very interesting um, in conjunction with thinking about this, which also leads back to the idea of design as research. Wilhelm Flusser has made this um, remark about industrialization. So first, we, first craftsmanship was something that you would handle on your own. That was a tradition, that was a, uh, something that you learn from other people. Now, um, in a sort of 
in a sort of machinic way, these memes have trained us in order to produce these industrialized uh, fabrication spaces. So we were able to, or they were able, um, however you would want to pronounce that, to dissociate craftsmanship from the people who own it. Really. And now we are in a sort of post-industrial environment where we have robots which again take over the, even the control over the processes. So I think in the very far future, and this is actually what Wilhelm Flusser also says, is that we'll be, inter we'll be interacting with robots which are sort of carrier of these genes, which is not unlike what my Matrix is actually uh, suggesting, where we are sort of training and informing each other. Um, yes? Um, I found this a very interesting presentation because I'm really interested in the body and I, I was attracted to come here because you were going to talk about the body. I found the um, model that you used about the expanding and the, and the contracting um, structure, but is so inspired, uh, referring to a pensegrity structure, which is the way that our bodies operate, mm. and which is probably what you're referring to when you're saying there is an echo and a resonance when we're looking at these things moving, where we somehow, beyond our consciousness, recognize it because somehow our bodies operate in that way. When we're breathing in, our bodies expand. When we're breathing out, they, they contract. When we are scared, we contract further. Mm. When we are in love, we expand out. Um, and spaces affect us in that way. Uh, I... Um, I found the presentation, uh, what I saw, um, a bit self-referential. Uh, and that is that it became uh, a thing about itself and the way that people interact with it was that this structure itself became the center of attention and, uh, and the whole entertainment. Mm. Uh, while in fact, um, the the structure, the integrity structure in our bodies, um, the purpose of that structure is perhaps to allow for life to take place inside it, for other things to happen. So I've been waiting for other things to happen. And I found a preoccupation with the mechanical amazement of the structure itself, which in itself is very interesting. That probably comments on this. I, I, I haven't seen your presentation about this thing that happened at the sculpture by the sea, the half circle, the, the, did you talk about that one? No. Um, but I understand you, you were involved. I thought that was brilliant. Mm -hmm. I, I was amazed and I was so happy to see that it was done with students uh, who just came out of the Faculty of Architecture. It was a very inspiring structure which was constructed at the end of the peninsula at the sculpture by the sea with a mirror in effect. I don't know how many of you have seen it. I thought it was brilliant. So, um, but it, did, it did create a very interesting space yeah. where people, uh, so that's the bit that was missing in this. You know, it's like how do we perceive the space within the machine, uh, robot-inspired, robot-made space that you create, that you create through understanding of geometry and through understanding of integrity and through understanding of complex computer systems. Yeah. I, I, I like that bit. Yeah. In there. Thank you for your observation. That is correct. And I would like to respond to the um, first part rather than the second part because mm -hmm. that's a project that we have been developing with a Master of Architecture student and they are, they are owners. So we empower these students and they are complete owners of this design. This is a reason why we have I have not presented that because that's actually not part of my research. Okay. That's part of my teaching. Um, but not of my continued engagement with that. But I think this critical reflection that you are, or this observation that you are offering is something that is very interesting because that also calls into question how much coding and how much program behavior do you actually need. So, in, and that was something that came out of the interviews or the discussions that we had with the performers themselves because what we try to, what we try to do with this performative installations is to engage sort of in a critical feedback. So we are sending people through or we are asking people how, how have they perceived these environments. And Gabrielle very strongly stated that her way of her way of occupying these structures was 
was almost limited simply because they had such a big life of their own, which was in a performative environment, as a sort of play environment, that's something that obviously, uh, that obviously leaves uh, more precise interactions within the play. But that's exactly also the property that lets people engage when the, uh, when the installation is silent. So what you're actually remarking is that relationship between something that is an installation and something that is a stage set design. So the stage set design is something that is a servicing structure, something that something that supports the theatrical play. Now what we've been producing with gold is something of a hybrid, so it has, it has a life and an operation of its own. And that's the reason why people came back after the play, to engage with these structures, to play with these structures, to spend time there. And I guess I haven't probably pointed out the way in which, in which that topography acts, because people, or, or what we enjoyed at the final lighting, was people really lying down underneath the structure, people enjoying these structures and, the, and your existence with being in them. I think at, at the end of the day, that, that is what architecture can offer. It's like, it's like a, I mean, maybe it's a bit too, maybe it's a bit too, too obsessive to say that, but if you could produce something that would be the equivalent of a sunset, wouldn't that be fantastic? A, a sunset, a day at the beach, something that, that just lets you breathe through, that lets you be. Why would you like to reproduce it in, through computer? Why not go to the beach? Anyway, that's something. It's a nice question. Like, yeah. <laughs> because we can. Last question. Last question. <laughs> um, fantastic work, really, mm -hmm. full of energy. Um, just something about the question of utopia. And I wonder to what extent you can add another dimension if you haven't already done so. That is <coughs> the dimension of catastrophe. Mm. Because the work seems to be about understanding the seamlessness of the, of the machinic, taking the natural, understanding it as a system, developing it as a system, which works in a seamless, perfect way. Maybe that's the utopian side. Have you, have you thought about it? incorporated in that the element of the breakdown. Yeah, I like yeah 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 no I know what you what you talk about. No no we have not yet because our gold is driven Black Spring was driven by this idea of something that's uh, that's the aftermath. That's a sort of reconstruction of human identity if you want. Gold was really very much about how can you find beauty in something that is <coughs> complete neglect and the deconstruction of a human soul. So everything, I think architecture is really a, it's almost like, a, from my personal point of view, from a sort of humanistic approach, is something that can, that must heal if it can heal, that can, that can try to support. Um, so gold try to, gold is going through overabundance, it's going through excess, but it's really trying to create that beauty in something that's completely disastrous. Where at the end of the day, the actor, only that they can do is they, they can really kill themselves. And my soul bleeds when I think about that story. So we did not really, from, from a sort of narrative point of view, there was not that chance to contaminate that system. But I, but I yes, yeah, it would be something that would be very interesting. And in fact, really with the fashion... Hmm? So can I add to that? Because um, I think this idea, this, this is seamless as the machine behavior is actually utopia. It doesn't actually happen like that. Like in the, in trying to program code, work with server modules, yes. yeah. uh, work with those inflatables, the, it, there's, a, there's an agency that there works. It has eruption as well. So we, um, you think you've got this, you know, one of very simple design, and you try to materialize it and it starts to deviate from mm. what you think it should be doing. And we, we saw that in lots of little ways and we didn't have, don't always talk about it because Yeah, uh, no, we want to talk about it. An emergent disintegration yeah. that China yeah. had. So that whole area I think in uh. a way answers your question for me. And that's that you, the work is the work. Yeah. But what it produces for me is a whole world of inquiry which is entirely yeah. about that. So for example, what place does catastrophe have and what place does the tragic have? Mm. 
And you know, the, this play is a tragic play. Yeah. And if you think of tragic Greek drama, to come against the perfection of the divine and to always fall short. Um, and that's a very piece of something about the tragedy. But if you took the tragedy and worked it into the system, mm. then I think you have you have um, well, it doesn't have to be work into the system. Yeah. The work is the work. I think it's what it produces in, in, yeah. in the person who comes to it. I think what I mean. What, this is just this is effectively the work of seven months. So it's like three projects that, that just explore or that 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 that, that are sort of architectural <coughs> forecasting of what is available to us. So of course necessarily this code is trying to achieve uh, perfection.